Hello everyone, welcome to the Pregnancy and Perinatal Care Lecture. I'm going to cover a wide variety of topics related to everything surrounding pregnancy. Uh, starting with the concept of uh, fertility treatments, I don't have a ton to say here because a lot of this goes beyond pharmacology, but you know, in the case any of you guys end up do working in a fertility medicine or working with patients through fertility problems, it's I think beneficial to talk about some of it. Um, so there are some pharmacologic options, and there are some non-pharmacologic options here, which I have listed here. Um, identifying the cause is certainly important as well, of course. There's different, uh, the WHO classifies um, a couple different categories of infertility-related issues, and you can see them broken down here. I'm not really going to go through it a lot other than just to say class 2 tends to be the most common. Um, hormones that, again, I'm not going to go through the uh, pathophys in detail on this, um, just because, again, it's, it's kind of a specialty area. So uh, a couple of things, let's just, I want to talk about some of the, again, more common ones. Um, clomiphene or clomid is probably one just to re remember and know um, for general practice, just because it is probably the most common. It and it's sort of the first line for infertility. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator, so um, it has estrogen antagonistic properties and agonist effects in different areas of the body. So you get uh, some um, conflicting effects if you just look at it kind of as an overview, but it works in different parts of the body, which hopefully has a synergistic approach to um, causing an increase in gonadotropin release. So if we go back to our uh, diagram here, um, if you if you're increasing if you're agonizing estrogen in certain areas and blocking it in other areas, you end up messing around with the body's feedback loops, and therefore you can uh, have an increase in certain hormones that can help you ovulate. And that's the concept behind clomiphene. So clomiphene, uh, you would take 50 milligrams once a day for five days. So it's a really short course, um, and then you can complete an additional course with double the dose after that. After you stop those two, you can start another one. Um, 30 days, or sorry, you can do it, you can space them out 30 days. So basically, uh, the idea is, is that you convince your body to ovulate with pharmacology, and you have intercourse about 5 to 10 days after the course is fully completed. It's really only effective for WHO, but again, that's our most common class there. Um, it has very little side effects with it, mostly because people don't take it very long term, so it's a really short term treatment option, and there's really only two chances for it, right? So once you do the second course, there's not really any other use for clomiphene. That's is why it's a really popular option because it's, again, it's a short, it's almost like a quick fix for certain patients. Um, it can cause develop of large ovarian cysts. That's the one side effect that's been linked to clomiphene use. But again, a really common one that's sort of the first line for couples with infertility, assuming they meet the WHO class 2 criteria. Um, gonadotropin therapy is a purified combination of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which are extracted from urine of postmenopausal women. Um, so you have to have a lot more monitoring with this. It's more expensive. There's a higher risk of multiple births, and it's useful for class one and class two. So a little bit different. Essentially, this is going to cause an increase in gonadotropin release, which should help you ovulate, um, and this would be directly giving you an increase in hormones. So if this process in the body isn't functioning even with estrogen receptor modulation, you can still give just the actual hormone itself and hopefully induce ovulation. So that's the, the goal behind these two products. Um, our drug metformin for diabetes actually has some data behind it with fertility. So insulin resistance occurs in polycystic ovarian syndrome. So treatment with metformin can cause an increase in menstrual um, uh, regularity and enhance spontaneous ovulation. Live birth rates are not as high as with clomiphene, and weight loss from increasing glucose utilization may also facilitate ov ovulation. Uh, so just generally treating diabetes is supposed to help with fertility, um, and metformin is, is, of course, a core treatment with that. But metformin has specifically been studied in people with polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's been shown to increase fertility. Aromatase inhibitors, I mentioned these very briefly during uh, the breast cancer lecture. I'm not going to talk about them anymore today, but they can be used in this area too. Uh, vaginal progesterone can be used, uh, be given as a gel suppository or tablet. It's a natural steroid homo hormone. Um, the mechanism uh, 
is uh, enhances the luteal or used in the luteal phase to support embryo implantation. So it's working locally. Don't really get a ton of systemic absorption with this. It's a nice um, topical effect, more or less. Uh, drugs, pregnancy, and lactation. All right, that's really all I want to talk about with fertility. And again, I'm not concerned you know a ton about that other than kind of knowing what clomiphene is and its mechanism. I would keep that one uh, in the bank. And then, um, you know, that metformin can be used too is probably a good thing to just have. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is really common. So whatever, even if you go into primary care, if you don't specialize in fertility medicine, it's probably something you'll see from time to time. All right, uh, pregnancy and lactation. So pregnancy and lactation, I've talked on and off about this is category X or D or whatever, and you're probably like, I don't really know what that means. And so now we'll we'll drill into it a little bit more. And it's a little confusing because they changed the recommendations and guidelines recently. Uh, but by and far, my favorite reference is the Briggs book. And this is one of the actual references where I keep a physical hard copy of this. I know I've pretty much gone electronic with everything else, but Briggs doesn't really have a great electronic version, although it has gotten better in the in the past, and we do have access to it through our electronic library at work now. It's a little bit roundabout to get there. I think they have an app too now that is maybe better than it used to be. Uh, to be honest, I haven't tried it in a while, so maybe it's gotten better, but as of a couple of years ago, it wasn't great. Uh, anyway, this book is great. Uh, it's got um, a really nice summation of everything you'd want to know about drugs and pregnancy and lactation. And it's very clean, uh, meaning that there's not a lot of excess information you have to wade through. Its recommendations are very specific uh, as far as it'll tell you, you know, generally compatible, and then it'll give you, so you look up, let's say the drug metformin, it'll say compatible with pregnancy. And then if you want to read more into it, you can read about the studies that summarizes the different results they had. And again, just generally a really good comprehensive um, product. The problem is, is it doesn't get updated like maybe once like, every couple of years, just like most textbooks. So if there's new drugs, you might not have them uh, as, as accessible with this product. And also you might just not um, have the body of data you would if you did like an online database that getting updated regularly. I will say that some online databases like UpToDate and uh, Micromedics have better pregnancy information now than they used to. Um, when I first started practicing in the ED, this was really my only source that had significant comprehensive pregnancy data. There's a couple other ones. There's ones called Mother's Milk and some other things out there. Um, but LexiComp, which is what UpToDate uses for their drug monographs, and Micromedics, which is another drug monograph system, are, are much better now. They all kind of have the same information, so it's not a big deal. But I do like this book a lot. Again, it's kind of the, the end-all be-all for me when I'm looking up this information. And it is really important. If you work with patients who are breastfeeding or pregnant, which probably most of you will encounter at some point in your career, regardless of whether, what practice you're going into, you might need to prescribe somebody, something to somebody who's either trying to get pregnant, is pregnant, or is breastfeeding, and that complicates things. So it's really important to understand what type of resources you have out there because everything is different. There's not a lot of hard and fast rules. A lot of stuff has very little data behind it, so you're usually looking at um, bodies of evidence that are small, maybe small studies, retrospective analysis, nothing that's randomized, controlled. So it's difficult to make assumptions uh, based on, you know, a class of drugs even sometimes. So that's why, again, having, knowing what references to work. And again, if you see this a lot in your practice, I'd invest in this book. Um, for most people, you know, an online app with like again, like up to date or whatever is probably fine. But again, I, I do like this book as a, as a drug reference. If you do come, come across this, um, I imagine most clinics would have something like this on hand. So, uh, okay. The FDA pregnancy categories no longer exist technically. However, all pre drugs prior to the change in the recommendations for the FDA still carry their letters with them. So that's like almost every drug on the market. So I still talk about the letters because they're still there. And if you look them up on a monograph, it'll say, this is category B. You're like, well, what exactly does that mean? So um, category A is the, is the best. That means that there are controlled studies in pregnant women show no risk in the first trimester. Uh, there's very little drugs. In fact, I can only think of maybe one or two that actually are category A. It's just we don't do randomized control studies in pregnant women unless we already know going into it there's virtually no risk. Um, I'll talk about an example of that here in a second. Um, category B and C are probably the two most common you're going to see. B is still pretty rare, um, but this would mean that animal studies showed no risk or 
animal studies showed risk, but we weren't able to confirm that risk in humans. Um, so uh, that's that's a little bit, there's a lot of gray area in that, right? Um, C is even more unexplained, I think. So you have animal studies show risk, caution is advised, benefit may outweighs risk. So basically C is animal studies are showing risk, uh, and we might think that there would be risk in humans. That's kind of the difference between the two. It's very subtle, I think, but it's a big deal if you can't confirm the risk in humans. A lot of that is because it just simply hasn't been studied or it wasn't studied at the time. So letters are, in order for the letter to be updated, I believe the drug company would have to go back and, and get an approval for that. And most times they don't because they don't care because uh, it's a small market and it's not worth their time to do the research and get the money. So a lot of times this falls on retrospective use. So let's look at uh, like anti-epileptic drugs, for example. I talked about this. So if you have a bunch of patients on an anti-epileptic and it got approved and they're like, well, we saw the animal studies had risk. And so we gave it a category C. But we look back and look at, you know, 100,000 women that have taken this during pregnancy over the last 10 years. And there's been virtually no side effects and we can say well you know the animal study showed risk but we haven't confirmed that risk in human and so the drug company might say well that's great but i'm not going to go back to the fda and file paperwork you guys can can publish your literature but we aren't going to change our, our label so that's the funny thing about it because some of these drugs might actually be really well established in pregnancy we've used them for years but they're still like category c so my point in this is don't get hung up on the categories too much. And that's why the FDA is kind of, well, has removed the categories altogether. Um, D means that evidence of risk to human fetus benefits may outweigh risk. Basically, if something's category D, that's a pretty big red flag. That means that we did have um, evidence during some sort of a clinical trial that this did cause risk or harm to a fetus, developing fetus. And X is, is a no-go. That's a contraindication. All right, so what's the new labeling that I was talking about? Uh, effective June 30th, 2015. So any new product on the market uh, that came out past this date has um, some new criteria with it. So the old letter system is gone. And instead you have specific details with three different categories. So you have pregnancy, including labor and delivery, lactation, and females and males of reproductive potential. So this is a little bit new because prior to this, drugs didn't really have or drug companies didn't really have to publish lactation data um they had to have some pregnancy data or some kind of a letter criteria for it and then the reproductive thing is also new as well um and including males in that too is especially new type of science to talk about like some of the things that we've thought as is decreasing reproductive potential or possibly being problematic for reproduction females might be problematic in males and might be, be transmitted to the female as well through various activities. So there's some issues uh, with that that are being more addressed with some of these new drugs. But again, new drugs, grand, a lot of these old ones are grandfathered into the current process. And I think they, they gave some of the older ones like, well, you guys have to figure this out eventually, but you have plenty of time to do it. So we'll see if we start to see more of this data coming through, but I imagine we aren't going to see a lot, a lot in the way of this. Um, other information, difference in dosing, uh, pregnant versus non-pregnant, and negative consequence of not treating a specific disease. So that's a new thing, too, is saying, you know, risk outweighs benefit. Treating this disease during, like treating epilepsy during pregnancy, much more um, beneficial than letting it go and, and avoiding the risk of the drug to the developing fetus. So there's that risk benefit for that specific disease. The problem with this, I think, is that it's it's a lot of information. So if you're looking for that quick and easy, oh, it's category A or category B or C, uh, people are used to that. And they're like, oh, it's category C. I can't use it. But as we just talked about, you can use a lot of category C drugs. So um, the letter system, while it's simple and straightforward, is misleading at best. And this system would require you to actually read the information, which is probably what healthcare providers should do if they're really looking for something. I've heard too many providers over my career just say, oh, it's category C. Uh, can I use this? I don't think I can use that. And it's like, well, actually, this is really commonly used in pregnancy. Oh, really? Well, why is it category C? And I've gotten that so many times I can't even you know, remember the number of encounters I've had with it. Uh, so it comes up all the time. And this is probably the better way to do it, where if somebody actually wants to look into the information, they're going to see specifically what the information is and have to interpret it themselves versus just looking at a letter and moving on. I just want to compare this to a couple other countries and what they do. So like in Australia, they have stratifications within categories. So the categories themselves are pretty similar to ours. But like, for example, they have three different categories of pregnancy uh, class B. 
can see them all here. I'm not going to go through them, but it's just here in case you're interested. I'm not going to test you on uh, German or Australian pregnancy categories, but here's German's categories. Again, much more stratification. As far as an exam goes, I do want you to know the FDA classes and what they mean, because again, they're so prevalent in practice right now. It's still important to understand them. So I will ask you a test question on what the difference is, and I'm going to base it off this slide here. So if you know these differences, you'll be good to go. Uh, the new labeling, I'm not going to ask you any questions on that, just because there's not really much to say. Uh, but I would like you to, I think you should generally know what the new labeling is going to have and, and why it's more comprehensive than the current system. All right, lactation is tricky because making recommendations for it is even worse. There's even worse data when you compare it to pregnant patients. So there's a couple things to consider. A lot of drugs are excreted into breast milk, but every pass your drug gets to different parts of the body, there's metabolic losses. So think about it this way. If you take a drug or if you're a breastfeeding mother and you take the drug orally, it goes through your GI tract and that loses some to the GI absorption process. Some gets excreted out. Probably it's not 100% bioavailable. Um, some will get lost to first pass metabolism and then it gets into systemic circulation. That systemic circulation eventually has to get into the breast milk supply, which there's probably going to be some metabolic losses in that process too. And the breast milk supply will get circulated. So the drug will equal, will, um, will move with its concentration gradient in and out of the breast milk supply. So that means as the drug starts to get eliminated from the body, it'll also get eliminated from the breast milk, which is why they say, you know, if you have a a couple drinks of, of an alcoholic beverage, you wait, you know, a certain amount of time because at the time, once the alcohol is out of your body, it's probably out of your breast milk as well. And that's the same thing for any type of pharmaceutical agent as well. Um, as far as what we reference, uh, usually it's a case to case basis. So what's the risk? What's the person's comfort level? What drugs are we talking about? Uh, all this stuff is, is worth exploring. Um, older medications are sometimes preferred due to data. So for some conditions, we might stick to a medication that might not be considered first line anymore because it has really good data with it with breastfeeding patients. And that's just a comfort level type thing. It doesn't mean that the new drugs are bad. It just means we don't have evidence to support that they are. Um, when in doubt, uh, pump and dump is always an option. So, uh, of course, people don't like doing this. It's wasting breast milk. And as a dad who's had two kids that are breastfed, I understand that that's a problem. Um, and so you can get around that with some timing things. But ultimately, it's up to the comfort level of the mother and the recommendation of you guys as the provider on what you think the risk is for breastfeeding on a certain medication. And if it's high enough, you might want to consider just not exposing the infant to it at all. Uh, if you look at AAP, they actually have really loose recommendations on a lot of this stuff, and they only recommend a couple things as contraindicated. Um, amphetamines, anti-neoplastic agents, which would be like chemotherapies, uh, bromocryptine, cocaine, other drugs of abuse, ergotamine, lithium, and nicotine. So there's really, that's a very small and kind of odd group of things. Half of these are drugs of abuse, too. Um, and then listed as safe. Relatively safe, uh, moderate alcohol, believe it or not, um, analgesics, antibiotics, anticonvulsants, moderate ca caffeine, insulin, and laxatives. So all those things would be considered relatively safe. So if you want to have your cup of coffee or your glass of wine at night and breastfeed, it's probably okay. The flip side of this is think about those metabolic losses getting into the breast milk. Then you have the child feeding. They're going to absorb some of that medication and some of that medication in, is in the breast milk getting into their GI tract. Some of it's going to get lost to excretion losses. Some of it's going to get metabolized in first pass. By the time it gets to their blood supply, it's hit so many different barriers that it's really diminished significantly in concentration. So you're really exposing the child to a small fraction of what was originally there to begin with. And that's something to think about too. It's not like they're getting a full dose of a med by breastfeeding. Uh, drugs that can decrease milk supply. Um, anticholinergics, some people get nervous about this, but I don't think the studies really match up to this. But uh, for example, Benadryl, some people will recommend not taking that while you're breastfeeding because the anticholinergic effects can decrease milk supply. Again, I don't think this is super clinically proven, but it is a, a potential interaction. Um, some other things here that I'm not going to talk about because they're all kind of rare. Um, nicotine, 
and estrogen probably would be the two common things you might see more often. Remember, we talked about estrogen products and um, combined oral contraceptives during the breastfeeding period generally not done, and a lot of that's because estrogen can decrease milk supply. If the patient isn't breastfeeding, then estrogen's not going to be right. You could use a combined oral contraceptive post uh, postpartum period. Um, drugs that can increase milk supply. Uh, I don't think I got this question once or twice. I don't think anyone ever actually changes their regimen to increase their milk supply. I've never heard of this being done, but some of them can. There's amoxapine, which is kind of an older antidepressant. Some antipsychotics can do this too, especially ones that cause increases in prolactin elevation like um, risperidone. Uh, methyl dopa for hypertension uh, in pregnant patients can increase milk supply. Uh, Reglan is a, um, or metoclopramide is an anti-emetic product. So some of those can, reserpine is a super old drug. Don't worry about that one. And I don't really care that you know this. It's just, it's kind of like a fun fact thing. And again, I don't think people ever, it's not like, oh, I'm going to prescribe you some Risperdal so you can increase your milk supply. That doesn't really happen in practice, at least not, to, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, other tips. So if you're going to prescribe something and you don't really under, or don't really have any evidence to go off of, you can use drugs with shorter half-lives. Generally, something with a shorter half-life isn't going to stick around as much. So especially if the patient can time it in between feedings, the idea is that the C-max concentration is going to be as far away from a feeding as possible. So let's say you're feeding at, I don't know, make up numbers here, uh, 6 a.m. and noon. Uh, for your infant and your drug. So you feed at 6 a.m., you take your medicine, it probably hits at C max maybe around 8 to 10 o'clock and it's going to taper off and then you could maybe do a feeding at noon after that's decreased in your body. Now if it's a really long half-life it might take a longer time to ramp up in the body or stick around longer too. So again, sometimes you just have to go with what's appropriate. And what if you're taking a drug every day that's got a 24-hour half-life and it's always that steady state in your body? Does that make a difference? So um, if you are concerned with certain things, uh, you know, taking something with a shorter half-life is an option, but not always for patients. Um, can the infant use the drug? It's always a question I ask myself if you don't have a lot of information. If the drug is approved for pediatric use, it's probably safe for infants. So that's something to consider as well. Look at the pediatric data for it. Uh, and see if it's been studied in young children. And if that's the case, it's probably relatively safe for a newborn. And again, especially if some gets consumed, and remember we're talking about very small doses and, and relatively speaking to a normal oral dose. All right, that probably wasn't super helpful, <laughs> but uh, talking about lactation, but the, the point is it's really complicated. I did a CE on this a little while ago, and it was all about calculating the amount of drug that got into it and certain drugs. It's just, it's super confusing, and there's still not a great recommendation, even if you do all those weird calculations and figure out, you know, how much is getting in. You can look at the size of the, the molecule and say, okay, larger molecules may be less likely to get into breast milk, and then you're like, okay, well, a molecule this size is 30% as likely to get in. It's just, it gets confusing, and I think it's more more well easier to look at uh, a more simple strategy to say all right what are we looking at what's the risk what kind of evidence do we have um, how likely is this drug to stick around and again I'm um, checking out those those risk parameters with with the drug in general all right pregnancy related complications okay so running through a bunch of common pregnancy related complications here uh, morning sickness Nausea and vomiting is associated with uh, pregnancy, very common, as most of us probably know, very most common in the first trimester. Causes unknown, likely due to some hormonal changes, but we don't for sure know why people get nauseous. Um, hyperemesis gravidarum is a really severe complication of nausea and vomiting that can actually lead into malnutrition and dehydration. I've seen patients come in with this, and they've actually gotten um, parenteral nutrition, which we'll talk about a little bit during critical care. But yeah, basically IV fluids with glucose, protein, and, and lipids all combined in it uh, just because they aren't getting any nutrition otherwise. And that can be detrimental to a developing fetus, of course. Um, Non-medical treatments, you got your classic saltines or just, you know, <laughs> relatively bland foods. Whatever the patient can stomach really, I think would be appropriate. Um, preventing the stomach from becoming completely empty is a strategy. So small snacks throughout the day versus large meals. Um, and then... You know, avoiding spicy foods, eating small, dry meals, and that's that's okay for some people, and generally it probably makes sense, but some people might find that certain things 
make them nauseous that you might not think about would maybe like a bland food makes them nauseous maybe something with a lot of flavor actually works for them so um whatever they can tolerate really i think is appropriate but these are just some kind of general recommendations right okay so for morning sickness or nausea and vomiting with pregnancy what do we recommend um category a product is the combination doxalamine pyridoxine uh, so this is a brand name combination product called Diclegis, which is a de delayed release version. Diclegis is super expensive and they just took two over-the-counter products and stuck them in one pill and called it extended release and, and charge a bunch of money for it. I don't recommend ever prescribing anyone Diclegis because they'll probably pay for it out of pocket and again it's super pricey. I would just prescribe the over-the-counter doxalamine with pyridoxine. Now the combination product dosing is slightly different so you, you'll just have to get as close as you can. But you can buy both of these OTC. Um, doxalamine is a first-generation antihistamine. It's kind of like a, a wimpy version of Benadryl, if you want to think about it that way. Um, pyridoxine is just vitamin B6. Um, now, this is, again, one of the only drugs I can think of that's category A. But this is a great example of somebody who made a product that we already knew was safe. So they're like, well, doxalamine and pyridoxine are, are long, long, long time have been used in pregnancy and are, are well known to be safe. So if we do a study on it, we can get category A pretty easily. Um, likely okay, category B stuff, meclizine, diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl, um, metoclopramide, or, which is Reglan, and promethazine are all thought to be relatively safe. Ondansetron or Zofran used to be first line for pregnancy, and a lot of people still use it. But the issue behind it is there was some large meta-analysis that looked at some evidence of birth defects and found that there might have been a slightly higher risk of oral facial clefts with Zofran. But there's been conflicting evidence on that, and some other large meta-analysis showed that it didn't cause that. And from what I know, um, right now it hasn't been not recommended to be used, but what we do is we use other things first. So this is kind of the way you'd go. You'd try your doxalamine pyridoxine, which again, this there, what, what I didn't really say about the efficacy of this therapy is a lot of people won't even respond to this because again, it's, it's, it's a very wimpy regimen. There's not good evidence for this combination, but again, it's category A. It's not gonna hurt the person. So if it works, it works great. If not, move on to the next one, but it's worth a shot. Um, and then you've got this bullet point here would be kind of your second line options. Zofran, I'd slot in here, and then beyond that, you could maybe try um, like steroids. Um, Prochlorperazine or compazine can be used as well, but it has, doesn't have as good of data. Um, herbal products, ginger actually has pretty decent data. If the person can stomach it and likes the smell of it, um, whether however they're consuming it, it can be um, have an anti-nausea effect. So that actually is pretty well proven. Heartburn. Uh, heartburn usually happens during the later half of the pregnancy, as you can imagine. The enlarged uterus puts pressure on the abdomen, abdomen, <laughs> abdom, <laughs> abdomen and stomach. I can't talk. Um, Non-medical options: smaller, more frequency, for more frequent meals. Avoid food, liquor, uh, three hours before bed. Elevate the head of the bed. Basically, the same things you'd recommend anyone who has uh, heartburn or GERD. Symptomatic treatment, uh, antacids are all fine in pregnancy. There's no problem with them. Sulcrophate is fine in pregnancy. Uh, H2 blockers and PPIs are going to be okay in severe cases. And I know that OBs prescribe these regularly, even though the evidence really only says that ranitidine is safe. It's an H2 blocker. PPIs have very little evidence in pregnancy. And um, like a famotidine doesn't really have a lot of evidence in pregnancy. The odds are they're all pretty safe. And I've seen PPIs prescribed in pregnant patients frequently um, for uh, uncontrolled heartburn that's not managed with ranitidine. So ranitidine would probably, I would recommend probably going to ranitidine first because it depends on the, the severity of the symptoms. If they're only getting it like once a day, maybe at night or something, and the Tums work, great. Uh, for other people, ranitidine is probably going to be the drug that, that'll help them the most. Uh, constipation, decreased peristalsis causes this, and that's part of the uh, hormonal changes and the effects in the GI tract. Um, Non-medical options include increased, just like all the other stuff we talked about with constipation already, 
high fiber food, water, exercise, um, symptomatic treatment, bulk lax laxatives, surfactants like docusate. Um, avoid mineral oil. Mineral oil, people don't usually use this as a laxative, but they can. Um, it does impair vitamin K absorption, has been linked to hypothrombinemia in uh, the infant. So we try not to use any type of uh, mineral oil as a laxative. But basically, you, you're looking at kind of your your very basic laxatives. I mean, there's other things you could do. You could probably use Miralax in, in a pinch if you needed to or something like that. But um, to keep it safe, you're going to stick to the non-medical and then the very basic symptomatic treatments. Hemorrhoids, uh, varicosities in the anal canal caused by pressure uh, below the uterus and treatment. Corrective con correct constipation can help. Sits baths. Um, external medications like tux pads, low potency corticosteroids like hydrocortisone uh, are probably fine. Some people think there's a risk of systemic absorption. You probably do absorb a little bit even if ex applied externally, but again the risk is probably really low and the amount you're absorbing is, is minimal. And steroids are, if you need to use them, are reasonably safe in pregnancy, so the, the risk of it is, is very minimal. So I think generally a topical low potency corticosteroid would be fine for most patients. Other anesthetics like topical lidocaine uh, might be okay as well, just depending on the severity of the symptoms. Headache, uh, another super common thing that people will get that they might not have never really experienced before uh, until they got pregnant. Um, hormonal fluctuations uh, are the cause generally, especially if it's a new symptom. If not, if they've had existing migraine history, the hormonal fluctuations can exacerbate that. They might see more uh, migraines than they're used to. Basic therapy, ice packs, rest, and acetaminophen are going to be your first line choices. Um, if none of that works, and remember with pain meds, they should work fast. You take acetaminophen, if you don't have relief in an hour, that's it hasn't worked. Okay? It's not going to kick in all of a sudden the next day. Um, so if that doesn't work, your next options go to antiemetics usually. So your antiemetic classes that we've already talked about. So metoclopramide, um, even diphenhydramine. Um, if you needed to use Compazine, you could go that route as well, uh, Zofran as well. Uh, so all that stuff would be indicated in this case. High-dose glucocorticoids, again, not ideal, but relatively safe when used uh, in, in short bursts in pregnancy. And then ultimately narcotics. Narcotics are relatively safe in pregnancy. They don't cause any birth defects. You don't want to use them chronically because then the, the child gets exposed to them and then you have to wean the child post them, but uh, they would be useful in a short period if you needed to treat a migraine. Drugs to avoid. Aspirin and NSAIDs, especially greater than 30 weeks, they can increase bleeding risk in the, in the kind of the late stages of pregnancy. Uh, so that's one of the big risks there. NSAIDs also have some, some birth defect issues that we know about. Um, triptans and dihydroergotamine, a uh, question about using those. Um, triptans have some conflicting evidence about uh, the use in pregnancy. And I believe I talked about this already in the, um, the migraine lecture, but generally they've become much more accepted in pregnancy and there are certain cases when they're uh, considered. I think you would still go with the other options first and then try just because uh, there has been so much concern over them in the past, but really most of the, the studies that have looked at an analysis of um, you know, thousands of women who have taken these during the first trimester, they just didn't really see major congenital malformations increase. And so with that in mind, they're, they're probably safer than we originally thought. And uh, the manufacturer originally put um, some, some warnings on them. And that's why people never use them. And then the more people have used them, because, you know, when you get down to some of the stuff, it just might not work. And you might just be like, well, should I use a narcotic or should I use a triptan? And that you know, what's the benefit or the risk here? So I'm not trying to say that triptans are worse than narcotics or narcotics are worse than triptans. I think it's a, a conversation to have with your patient and what they want to try. And then looking into some of the evidence yourself. I mean, I'm not making a firm recommendation here because there is conflicting evidence, right? You've got the manufacturer saying one thing. And then, um, you know, if you look at like a, a bunch of, for example, Swedish women who took triptans over the, the period of the late 90s to early 2000s, you see, you don't see that increase in risk there. So um, DHE, 
probably not uh, recommended. Uh, but triptans, again, you could probably put those up in this category if you if you need to now. So uh, drugs to avoid, uh, that's a little bit of a misnomer now. I think it is uh, acceptable to use them, in, especially in more severe cases that other therapies aren't working. All right, respiratory problems. Um, nasopharynx blood flow increases, so women can kind of just have sinus congestion, and basically the treatment would be how do you treat a non-pregnant woman, and can you apply that to a pregnant woman? Well, that's pretty much the case for all of these, right? <laughs> There's not really a whole lot of difference. It's not like somebody's um, not going to respond to a normal therapy because they're pregnant most of the time, but it's just a matter of keeping safe. It's usually what we're looking at is um, non non-pharmacologic things like steam humidifiers, um, basic therapies for treatment, symptomatic relief like um, acetaminophen, chromalin nasal sprays, ipatropium nasal sprays are safe. Um, as far as sinusitis or sinus infections, stick to your beta-lactam classes and then possibly azithromycin. Um, and then as far as other symptomatic relief goes, intranasal glucocorticoids can be really helpful. Just remember that they take a few days to work, so don't expect immediate relief from them. But if the patient keeps up with them for a couple of days, they should have some pretty big impact. And there's very little systemic absorption with those. So the odds of getting any type of, you know, exposure to the fetus is very rare. Um, Vasoconstrictors we usually avoid, so our drugs like Sudafed or even topical ones like phenylephrin or oxymetazoline or afrin, we usually avoid those because if those do get swallowed or they do absorb into the bloodstream, they can restrict blood, circulate, blood supply to the uh, placenta uh, and that can cause, uh, of course, issues. So we want to watch out for that one specific, for those categories specifically and generally, again, we're avoiding these. So if you're looking for the most advanced symptomatic relief, you're probably going to look at steroids and making sure the patient's taking them regularly for a few days to give them a chance to work. Coagulation disorders. So I talked about pregnancy having the uh, high, a much higher risk, about 70 per 10,000 compared to birth control or compared to the general population. You are at much higher risk for um, DVT, PE specifically. Um, if you did have uh, a history of DVT, PE, you're automatically going to be anticoagulated during your pregnancy. If you have a prosthetic heart valve, any deficiencies in clotting factors, antiphospholipid antibodies, you would all those would all qualify you as well for anticoagulation. So what do we anticoagulate with pregnancy? Um, heparin, um, IV if inpatient, sub-Q if outpatient. Heparin does not cross the placenta. It's a big molecule, so you don't have to worry about that. Low molecular weight heparin sub-Q is also safe. It's drugs like anoxaparin or lovinox and deltaparin. Um, we avoid warfarin, and we don't give new oral anticoagulants at this time. Again, I've said this before, I think, but I believe that the new orals eventually will probably be proven to be, at least some of them might be shown to be safe in pregnancy, and they'll likely become the preferred agents, I think, at some point in our careers. But at this point, there's just not a good body of evidence to support that yet. Uh, the market would be great because this is a big area of treatment. A lot of patients qualify for this, believe it or not. And you have um, the options here are injections for the most part. There's not really an oral option right now. So if we could get an oral option for these patients, it'd be a big win, not only for that drug company because they'd be able to market their product for a different indication, but also for your patients to be able to take something orally versus injecting themselves for an entire pregnancy. Certainly going to be a benefit there. We, this is another topic we're reviewing that we talked about already. Uh, first line therapy is usually insulin, regular insulin, NPH, and Lispro aspart have all good evidence in pregnancy. The longer acting insulins like Lantus and so on and so forth do not, but doesn't mean they can't be used. And I don't think it'd be totally out of the realm of possibility to see them used. Just we, again, we don't have the evidence to support it. Usually with gestational you're looking at a new case of diabetes, so the person doesn't have a history of using insulin. If it's different where it's somebody who's a type 1 or type 2 diabetic who already is on insulin, that's a, a you know a totally different story. Um, oral options, sulfonylureas, especially gliburide, have pretty good evidence. Metformin um, has decent data supporting its use as well. It's likely safe, although not quite as good of support as gliburide. Hypertension, uh, generally speaking, gestational hypertension is blood pressure over 140 or 90 without proteinuria or pathologic edema. Once you add proteinuria, you get preeclampsia, um, which is initiated by the presence of trophoblasts. So during the pregnancy process, that's what's going to initiate the occurrence of the hypertension. And then with the protein in the urine, 
that's where you get uh, the preeclampsic diagnosis, and that's where we start to take things very seriously. Um, about zero, uh, about half, or sorry, one half to two percent of preeclamptic women will progress to an eclamptic seizure, and that is without treatment. So we want to make sure we're treating everyone, so we prevent that two percent from getting there. For patients with chronic hypertension existing 20 weeks before uh, gestation, um, you treat them the same way. You're just going to watch out for those. Remember the one class of meds we really can't give during pregnancy, which is going to be our ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Um, but we still want to treat those patients the same way and treat them, manage their hypertension appropriately, making sure they don't progress into a preeclamptic state. Here's preeclampsia with severe feature definitions in case you're curious. Um, for preeclampsia prevention, aspirin has been studied. I don't see this used a whole lot, but it's possible. Um, 81 milligram aspirin started at the second or end of first trimester. A little controversial because aspirin's thought not to be okay in pregnancy, but in low doses, it's probably fine. Um, preeclampsia is associated with increased platelet turnover, and it's thought that aspirin will help um, prevent clotting risk with that process. However, the benefits are probably mild. You would want to discontinue it five to 10 days before delivery to avoid excess bleeding. Uh, mild to moderate treatment, uh, deliver the baby if that's appropriate based on the time frame of gestation you can deliver. Uh, methyl dopa has long been the, the drug of choice. However, we've really moved away from methyl dopa, I think. Even though it's thought of as this you know, great drug in pregnancy, it's really a weak antihypertensive. So what I see done a lot more commonly is labetalol and nifedipine are probably the two common drugs that our hospital uses for um, hypertension in pregnancy. You want to avoid your ACEs and ARBs. Severe treatment, high dose magnesium sulfate. We give magnesium sulfate at really high doses um, over a fast period of time. It has good anticonvulsant properties. It's a uh, smooth muscle relaxant, helps relax the uterus as well. Um, blood brain barrier protection, and um, again, it's more effective than uh, a benzodiazepine. You can use for, a, for an eclamptic seizure, you can give midazolam or lorazepam or some type of benzodiazepine too. Those will work. It's just magnesium's preferred and usually does the trick by itself. Chronic hypertension, uh, I just talked about these options, but it's the same thing. So methyl dopa, uh, your beta blockers like labetalol, metoprolol is also probably safe in pregnancy. It's pretty well studied as well. Calcium channel blo blockers are likely all to be safe. So the dihydropyridine ones um, and nifedipine is the one that's used most commonly and then hydralazine as well. So really labetalol, nifedipine, probably your first two choices, methyl dopa and hydralazine kind of be the second line options there. All right, perinatal care, preterm labor. So term labor, 37 to 40 weeks. Preterm labor would be uter uterine contractions with cervical changes prior to that 37-week mark. Um, Non-pharmacologic treatment is usually bed rest, hydration, stopping smoking if you're still smoking. Prophylaxis, you can give IM progesterone every week between 16 to 36 weeks. Uh, it's a drug called McKenna is a brand name. It's hydroxyprogesterone, so it's a, um, a synthetic progestin-type product. Um, progesterone suppositories may also be used as well. Uh, so this would be maybe for somebody, if you're going to start it early, it depends on when they start going into labor. You could start it really any time in this period, but that's kind of a lot of injections, but it's something that can sustain the pregnancy longer. Um, we'll talk about this during PEDS, but so many complications with young children, um, especially neonates, are related to preterm labor, uh, preterm delivery, and if that's the case, um, we can if we can keep them in the womb longer, that's going to help their lungs develop, help their kidneys develop, help everything develop better by the time they're actually born. Um, tocolytic drugs. So overall mechanism for a tocolytic drug is to inhibit uterine contractions. Um, so you basically are stopping that process from happening, um, especially if the cervix is dilated less than four centimeters and membranes are still intact. You have a good chance of stopping labor with some of these agents. Terbutaline is a common one. It's a beta-2 agonist that relaxes bronchial and uterine smooth muscle mimics, uh, sorry, minimal effects on heart rate. So uh, it doesn't really affect the heart muscle as much. It can affect breathing a little bit though and lungs. It'll affect the smooth muscle in the lungs, but it's an agonist, so it should help actually open up the lungs. It's not going to like cause somebody to have breathing issues. Um, often used, but not FDA approved for labor. Uh, may be given IV or sub-Q. Oral product has a lack of efficacy there. Uh, this is this one's kind of funny that this drug's really only used for, for labor and delivery purposes, and it's not really FDA approved for that. Um, 
not to be used more than 48 hours IV. After you give this a long time, it builds up in the body, and ultimately you can get some hemodynamic effects and arrhythmias, things like that, so we do want to avoid that if we can. Other side effects, tremor, hypertension, nervousness, angina, uh, angina, excuse me, um, hypoglycemia, and type 2 diabetics as well. Other drugs, magnesium sulfate inhibits uterine activity. Um, indomethacin is a NSAID. Uh, the suppositories inhibit prostaglandin synthesis, and prostaglandins are a big component of uterine contractions as well. You can give it PO or rectally. Contraindications, platelets, bleeding problems, just like any GI, or sorry, just like any NSAID would have contraindications for. You avoid it in gestation over 32 weeks, and you don't use it for more than 72 hours total. The reason is, is because, uh, well, actually, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, nifedipine, calcium channel blocker, prevents uterine muscle contractions, uh, may cause hypotension if given with magnesium. So if you give these two together, they both have hypotensive effects, so you got to watch the blood pressure. Okay, so let's talk about our algorithm and how we generally treat what's preferred. Um, for 24 to 32 weeks gestation, you're usually going to use an NSAID like indomethacin. Um, after that, the, there's thought to be a risk with NSAID exposure and also um, increased bleeding risk with NSAID exposure. So um, if the patient is at 32 or 34 weeks gestation, um, nifedipine is uh, the drug of choice here, or if maybe the NSAID is contraindicated to begin with. Uh, second line at 32 to 34 weeks is terbutaline. Um, post 34 weeks, it's a little bit debatable whether or not you need to do anything. I think sometimes they'll, they might delay it depending on you know what the risk of the patient is, how developed the, the infant seems, things like that. But sometimes they might just deliver at that point. Um, when you're really before that 34 week mark, there's some developmental issues that can happen. After the 34 week mark, it's a lot more clear cut as far as lung development and things like that. It's not ideal. Um, and ideally, you get up to that 37 week, but certainly a 34 week pregnancy is very, very viable. And um, at that point, the risks of giving drugs just might not matter. You know, might be outweigh might the risk of stopping the process might outweigh the benefit. And of course, you have to look at other things too, like cervical dilation and membranes uh, intact. Too, if those things, if the cervix is dilated, membranes in, are are not intact anymore. You could very well have a, a situation that you can't really control at that point with drugs, and you just gotta gotta roll with it then. All right, induction of labor. So this is the opposite effect of the tocolytic agent. So again, se severe maternal infections, uterine bleeding, preeclampsia, diabetes, macrosomia, um, some other things there too would all be reasons why you would induce labor. Com most common agent to induce labor is oxytocin or pitocin is the brand name of this. Oxytocin is exactly what it sounds. It's just oxytocin uh, made in a lab and put in a bag. It's the drug of choice for labor induction, a naturally occurring hormone that involved in birth and lactation. What it does is you give somebody a lot of oxytocin, it makes their uterine, uterus contra contract really hard. Uh, so you get these big contractions in the uterus, just like your body would do during labor. That's what's driving the uterine contractions is a wave of oxytocin hormone release. That's the same thing that's going to happen during um, when you give the drug. So for people who aren't having labor, um, the oxytocin can help supplement that natural hormone that would normally cause the, uh, the delivery of the infant. Uh, IV only risks, you can get uterine rupture, you can have utero placental hypoperfusion, so it can actually cut off blood supply to the, to the placenta because you end up with such strong contractions. The fetal distress from potential hypoxia as well. Um, from what I've heard, my you know my wife didn't need oxytocin to, to induce either time, but uh, from what I've heard from people who have oxytocin and who haven't, who have done both ways, um, the oxytocin contractions are much more strong and painful than a natural contraction. Uh, so it does seem to be like when you give the pharmacologic agent, it's it's going to be more intense than if your body was releasing oxytocin on its own, just for what it's worth. Uh, methyl ergonavine or methergen is an ergot alkaloid. It increases tone rate amplitude of contractions on the smooth muscle of the uterus, causes powerful sustained uterine contractions. We usually don't use meth methergen for this. We actually use it postpartum for bleeding. So if somebody is having um, bleeding, uh, significant bleeding in the postpartum period, the methergen can clamp down all those blood vessels very in a very potent way. Usually not used as an induction agent. We pr pretty much oxytocin's 
the only thing you do is to induce people. Nothing else really matters. It's going to work in most patients. So you really don't need to do a whole lot else. If oxytocin is not working, the person's probably looking at getting a C-section. I don't think they're going to go to methogen or another drug. It's possible, but really not. Um, one other thing they might do occasionally um, or sometimes is the Cervidil, which is dinoprostone. It's a prostaglandin E2 um, analog, and it's a vaginal insert, uh, which kind of comes in like this mesh. It's frozen, and once it warms up to room temperature, it, it melts really quickly. You apply it directly to the cervix, which can cause um, uterine hyperstimulation, abdominal pain, um, and it's going to help induce labor. So that's another way they do it in a local fashion. Usually they'd combine that with oxytocin to do both. That's that's a really relatively common thing that I see done at our hospital. Uh, misoprostol. Um, Again, most likely this is going to be used for hemorrhage, not uh, for um, inducing labor, but it could be as well. It's a prostaglandin E1. It's kind of like an NSAID. Um, and uh, it's, it's well, sorry, it's kind of like the opposite of an NSAID, I should say. Uh, so vaginal for induction and um, PO for abortion and hemorrhage. So you could use misoprostol to abort a pregnancy as well because of the effects of, of how it works. Okay. Postpartum hemorrhage, uh, vaginal cesarean birth, uh, initial management is going to do fundal massage, fluid and blood products as needed, oxytocin infusion. Pretty much everyone who gives birth is going to get a bag of oxytocin just to clamp down on that uterus. Um, the reason is, is once the placenta detaches, there's a lot of blood vessels there, and there can be, there's going to be a fair amount of bleeding in every person, uh, but it can be really intense in some people. And so the oxytocin in the immediate postpartum period can help clamp that down and decrease that blood flow right away and allow it to heal faster uh, so that the clot the clots up a little bit better. That's basically standard of care. Uh, misoprostol PO or PR is kind of the second option you would try. Um, the next step after that uh, would be methyl, methyl organivine, like we talked. Carboprost is a prostaglandin F2 analog. It's another, again, another prostaglandin product, and it's going to cause those um, those con those um, uh, clamping down of blood vessels. All the drugs pretty much do the same thing. They might work on different receptors, but the end goal is to clamp down blood vessels and to, to clamp down on the uterus, make it contract really hard so that the blood can't flow to it. Therefore, you, you eliminate your bleeding risk that way. Um, for a C-section, that's different, right? That's post-surgical, so incision site and things like that would need to be managed just like any surgical case. Pain management, um, narcotics are okay and safe to give during labor and delivery. Uh, most other medications won't do anything, as most of us probably know, pregnancy or um, delivery and uterine contractions are one of the most painful things that a human can experience um, naturally. So it is something that if you gave somebody like Tylenol, it's probably not going to do anything for their contractions. Um, the mainstay of pain management during uh, a labor and delivery period is a, an epidural. And so what we use is a fentanyl epidural that has ropivacaine in it. Um, so the true drugs combined do two di very different things, but they both, so the drug is, is has a catheter that gets tunneled into the epidural space. Uh, so an anesthesiologist will put this in and the ropivacaine sits in that epidural space. It hangs in an area that allows it to sit lower so that it only blocks nerve impulses to the lower part of the body. So you can still move your arms, you can still breathe. That's all good, right? You don't want to paralyze those things. Uh, but you might not be able to move your legs quite as well. Most people can move their legs a little bit, but they feel a little bit numb. Um, but it's going to block nerve impulses to the uterus. And so you're still going to have your contractions. It's not going to stop your contractions. But the nice thing about these is you don't feel it. So for an epidural, it's really actually kind of a, a pretty amazing strategy to manage pain because there's so little risk with them. If the person install, installing is kind of a bad word, but the person administering it, the anesthesiologist is well experienced, there's there's very little risk. Um, sometimes people get headaches with them. Um, people can have long-term lasting headaches. It's super, super rare, uh, but it is possible, uh, but very low complication rates with epidurals. Uh, we do probably a 10 of them a day at our hospital, believe it or not. So very, very common. Um, the opioid part of it, so fentanyl um, is the opioid we use. You can do, uh, some places might use morphine or, or hydromorphone in their epidurals. We use fentanyl at our hospital. I think that's pretty common. Uh, fentanyl is really lipophilic, so it doesn't really stay in the epidural space. Ropivacaine will stay in the epidural space. It's not going to leak out into other areas of the body. The fentanyl will just kind of disperse and get into the central nervous system. So it's helping to decrease pain sensations. Um, 
on the on the on the central nervous system side of things, whereas ropivacaine is actually blocking the nerve impulses. So it's a dual mechanism that way to really eliminate the pain overall. Um, intrathecal single shots like preservative-free morphine. There's really long-acting morphines, and um, sometimes you can use fentanyl for this too. You inject a little bit into the intrathecal space. A lot of times, this is done during a C-section. Like if you don't, or if you don't have time to get an epidural started, or don't have the ability to, you can try doing this. Um, that's a second option. But usually, this would be more for like a, somebody going into the OR for a, a C-section. Fetal bradycardia. Um, ephedrine is the most common thing used for this. Ephedrine is kind of like a presser, but a little bit less of a version. It increases release of norepinephrine from tissue stores, and you get some alpha and beta adrenergic stimulation. It is a controlled substance, most because no one would actually abuse this, but it is used to make methamphetamine. And some, if you had it like on an industrial scale, you could make methamphetamine with it. So it is controlled from that perspective. But um, if you get an epidural started, you're going to have um, uh, fetal monitoring going on, and you're going to do that during the labor process anyway. But if the heart rate starts to drop on the fetus, they'll come in, they'll reposition you know, the, the, the woman a little bit uh, to see if sometimes the epidural can, can get stuck on one side of the, in the epidural space, it can cause some issues, or sometimes the patient might not feel like they might be sitting in an odd position that's cutting off some blood flow or something like that. Anyway, there's a lot of different things that can happen, but the point is you can reposition the person a little bit, maybe roll them onto a different side, roll them onto their back if they're on one of their sides, and hopefully that's going to um, take care of some of the issue with that. Uh, ephedrine is the, the choice they'll give. They'll give a little bit of ephedrine that usually gets the heart rate back up while they can get the repositioning going to make sure that that epidural's um, working properly. Uh, but that's the big risk with, um, with an epidural is that fetal bradycardia. So they watch that very carefully. Um, it happened in, in my... For my wife, for the first time, our, our son's heart rate dropped a little bit while he was still in the womb, and they like five people rushed in. I remember I was like half asleep on the couches in the middle of the night, and, and all these people came in, and then you know two seconds later it was fine. And then one the nurses are arguing over why the person even bothered calling anyone in and all, <laughs> all that stuff. So um, it certainly happens, but um, it's it's very manageable with uh, with ephedrine. Um, post vaginal delivery, usually post uh, delivery we do scheduled NSAIDs and and acetaminophen. This is something we actually started pretty pretty recently where we alternate now. They used to do like scheduled Tylenol and then PRN NSAIDs and now what they do is every three hours you get one. So you get so you know you start at our you know midnight you get your um, acetaminophen dose, three in the morning you get your NSAID dose, six in the morning you get another acetaminophen dose. So it alternates that way so you're always getting something every three hours. The idea is you get around the clock medication. There's been some studies that show that that's helpful. It's relatively benign, uh, but yeah, it's high dose NSAIDs and high dose acetaminophen postpartum. Occasionally you might see like a little bit of oxycodone or um, like a hydro hydrocodone, like a Norco type product added on as well um, for PRN things. Um, uh, specifically like for an episiotomy or something like that, they might do that where there's a little bit more pain than, than normal, but there's, uh, there's just um, a couple different options there for that. And again, usually you're probably looking at oral medications. Really, would you need anything IV, post-vaginal delivery? Post-C-section is a little bit different. Um, you might need to, you'd manage that like a post-surgical case, right? With surgical incision, cutting through muscle layers. So IV narcotics may be indicated, but if the patient can get by on oral, that's probably the, the preferred option there. All right. All right, perinatal infectious disease. Final section here, group B strep, starting there, um, colonizes in the GI and genital tracts of 15 to 40 percent of all pregnant women. Mothers won't be symptomatic from group B strep. Maternal colonization can lead to vertical transmission, and group B strep is the most common cause of a lot of our neonatal infections like meningitis, sepsis, uh, and, um, and other types of things too. Uh, so group B strep cultures done at 35 to 37 weeks. Positive women will be treated with intrapart intrapartum antibiotics. Usually we use a couple different things, penicillin, ampicillin, and cefazolin. Penicillin is sort of the gold standard. Um, at our hospital, we actually use ampicillin. Not because penicillin doesn't work, but because ampicillin is really easily supplied. Penicillin, you have to like compound it, and it has short dating on it. Ampicillin, we can give a little vial of it and hook it up to a bag on the unit. It's, it's much more convenient for everyone. So we use ampicillin, but all of these are fine. If you have somebody with a severe beta-lactam allergy, clindamycin is usually the alternative people go to. Uh, 
Corio amnitis, amnionitis, I don't know, I'm probably saying that wrong. <laughs> anyway, it's an intra-amniotic fluid infection, and it causes maternal fevers in the peripartum period, associated with 20 to 40% neonatal sepsis and pneumonia. Um, I'll show you the, the microbial makeup on the next slide. But basically, there's a lot of different bugs that could be responsible of this, and you're looking at a diagnosis based on a fever, temperature greater than 100.4. Um, so we treat with, quote-unquote, broad-spectrum antibiotics. This is an area of medicine where we still use some kind of old school drugs. Not that clindamycin is really not used anymore, but for this particular thing, you could probably use different regimens. It's just this is what's been studied. So people use ampicillin, gentamicin, and clindamycin. You could probably get by instead of using gent, like a third generation cephalosporin, and be fine and get rid of the clinda and the gent too. Um, do you really need all these? That's a good question. Why we do that this way? Again, there's evidence behind it. It's how we've always done it. OB is kind of like that, where they're somewhat stuck in the past on certain treatment strategies. Not to say that's a bad thing, and not to say it doesn't work, but um, the nice thing about these regimens is you're usually doing very short term. So uh, most patients just get like a single dose, and then if the fever goes down, they stop it. So they don't continue this for weeks. Sometimes they might do it. If they're doing it for more than a day or so, then you might get a more serious thing. And that's probably a time to get an infectious disease consult and maybe manage it differently. But usually you do like a single dose of these three agents, and that's enough to, to treat whatever bugs you know, you've got going on. And this is just to, to show the polymicrobial. You get anaerobes and gram positives and gram negatives in all different uh, capacities here with different percentages of increase. Endometritis is another cause of postpartum fever. So this would include any or uh, occur on any two days in the first 10 days postpartum exclusive of the first 24 hours. So that's a big difference between choreo is that this one's going to happen later. Choreo is going to happen more immediately. It's polymicrobial, similar drugs, IV clindamycin plus gentamicin, or you could just use IV ampicillin solbactam with unison, which is the more common one to do is just to give unison because it's a one, uh, one drug regimen. Um, B. fragilis susceptibility could depend. That's a common product or common drug you're going to need to target with these antibiotics. So Clinda has okay B. fragile. Unison usually has pretty good B. fragile um, uh, sensitivities. So uh, again, Unison is going to work for the, the majority of people. Uh, administer antibiotics until patient is approved or improved in afebrile for at least 24 to 48 hours, and then you don't need to follow up with oral, you just stop them at that point. So it's, it's kind of weird infectious disease, really short courses, get the patient afebrile and stop everything. I can't, I can't really think of anything else like OB ID management, but it's been studied, it's been done for years, decades, it, it works, it's fine. Um, it is a little bit bizarre though. Uh, I don't care you know about Torch, it's on here for, for just you know, completion sake, talk about some of these different agents, some viruses and things like that that can cause uh, some potential complications, which I've got listed here. And uh, that's it. So that's it for this lecture. We'll do a more comprehensive lecture on pediatrics next week and uh, then follow it up with men's health for the exam. So uh, thanks for tuning in today, guys, and let me know if you have any questions.